Um, so, uh, I'm Phil Trailford. I work at a company called Trayport. Uh, Trayport is a market leader in energy trading software. So, um, the light in the um, chandelier up here will have been traded approximately 13 times on our system before it hits. Um, we have about 13,000 trades, uh, uh, sorry, um, trading screens um, across Europe, the US, and Asia. So, um, that's where I've worked for the last five years. My background is actually in video games, um, so I've done assembler, C++, all sorts. Uh, I actually find F Sharp a really close fit to the way I used to think about C++, ironically. So how many people here have done some F Sharp before? We've got about half, and C++. Algol 60. <laughs> Great, winning. There's always one. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, when you um, when you choose a language, you're you're kind of picking a community, and um, you get the richness that community has. So, if you're doing web programming, probably you'd be thinking, "I'll go Ruby because they've got great style sheets," and if i if I'm or, or Node.js because they've got some lovely single page apps. If you want abstract uh, singleton proxy bean factories, then you probably pick Java. And um, in terms of finance, um, machine learning, uh, you probably want to look at something that's functional, something like F sharp. So I help run the Functional Londoners Group in, um, here in London. And um, we were founded about three years ago. Uh, we've got close to 650 members now. Uh, we meet every two weeks. And the consistency of the group is about a third finance. Uh, the other third. Um, is kind of um, insurance and sports betting, so kind of semi-related to finance. And then there's a, a misc third of um, all sorts. Uh, quite a lot of gaming, actually, so uh, video games, social gaming. Uh, so we cover topics like finance, machine learning, uh, reactive, and functional. So if you're interested in finance, I think it makes sense to go to the community and choose the language where you're going to meet experts and be able to get help. Uh, F Sharp itself, uh, we have, these are the, uh, the blue uh, dots are user groups across the world. Uh, the yellow ones are functional groups that do quite a lot of F Sharp content. So you can see we're, we're pretty well spread, but the main focus are, and the larger groups tend to be in the financial centers because that's where F Sharp's being used most. Uh, the earliest adopters of F Sharp were uh, investment banks. Um, so the investment banks, particularly in London, started to adopt F Sharp uh, around 2007, and they pushed through and pushed to get uh, F Sharp into Visual Studio, uh, and it came out in Visual Studio 2010. So you can just literally do file new projects. Um, but the kind of people I meet in the group, we've got uh, quite a lot of hedge funds coming in. Uh, insurance has got gone from strength to strength, so you've got a lot of actuaries. Uh, prop shops uh, and utilities. Uh, one of the things we find is that uh, probably of, of the people who come in, only half are specifically developers. And a large number of people are using F Sharp like they might use R or MATLAB or co in combination with those. So we've got actuaries who aren't um, you know, out and out programmers, quants and traders using the system because it's a very natural language. Um, it's very close to their MATLAB experiences closer to the way they think. Actually, um, when I started with F Sharp, I was working in a machine learning group in Cambridge, working uh, with machine learning researchers. And F Sharp was a language that we could both talk. I could talk um, the .NET side, and they could express their maths, and we could work together. So it's a, probably a pretty productive space to be in, rather than somebody jotting down a load of maths, and then six months later, some C++ or C Sharp code comes out that doesn't match, and then you can't read that either. So um, it's close as the domain. So why are people using F Sharp in finance? Um, well, that color hasn't come out great there. Um, this is uh, a forthcoming um, Manning book, um, but the cover has to be changed. Uh, they didn't like my idea there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's a, 
bunch of testimonials on the F Sharp org site saying why people have adopted F Sharp, what sort of benefits they've got. And these are the themes that tend to run through. These are the themes that run for our company as well. If you need time to market, efficiency, correctness, and solving complex problems, then F Sharp's a great fit. If you're doing web pages, like we mentioned before, you're not going to get a huge value from it. Or if you're doing CRUD apps, it's not, not the language for you. So I think this is probably where functional languages in general start to give you value. So I'll just go through some of the examples. Um, here's time to market. Um, Jan at uh, Gamesys found an order of magnitude <laughs> increase in productivity. And that's, that's something you can get excited about. That's something you can tell your boss and start adoption. Jan will be speaking uh, later this afternoon. Um, they were taking about two months using Java to uh, produce a new uh, application, and they've gone down to days now. And that's huge. And they're getting the, the correctness and solving complexity at the same time. Uh, the um, system they have is, has about 150 million requests per second with 700,000 unique visitors per day. Uh, and there's a great uh, talk uh, that Jan did with the .NET Rocks crew uh, a couple of months ago if you want to find out more details. Um, here's a very recent um, uh, testimonial uh, from Handels Bank over in Sweden. Performance is phenomenal. Um, can't argue with that. Uh, that's been my experience as well. Uh, we can recalculate the entire portfolio in less than a second. And I think they were in the hours uh, rate before that. So obviously you can, if you spend months and months cranking your C++ and tuning it, you may get there. You'll get there a lot quicker with F Sharp. You're going to get close performance um, on like for like, but because you can iterate quicker, you can find the algorithm that actually solves the problem quicker. Um, at least that's how I found it. Uh, here's a fixed income company. This is one of the major problems of doing presentations for F Sharp in finance is that um, most people want to remain anonymous and not really share their um, extra experience because uh, they, they, they feel they're getting extra leverage and they want to ha keep that to themselves. Uh, but leads to virtually bug-free code. When I run my C Sharp code, I usually feeling a little bit tepid about, um, oh, dear, it's going to blow. <laughs> And um, because I've had to do a bit of extra work, the, stat the compilers forced me to think about some things. Usually when I hit F5, when I run my application in F Sharp, I feel pretty confident it's not going to crash, which is a really wholesale change. It feels good. Um, and on complexity, this is um, from a slightly different domain. Uh, Byron Cook um, is a, a researcher in Cambridge. He recently won the uh, British Computer so uh, Society Roger Needham Award, and he um, does proof systems for all of the Windows device drivers. So um, he checks termination. And since um, his F sharp program called Terminator, awesome name for a termination detection system, um, was put in place, there's been a lot less crashes. They actually found a, a really big termination issue in the device driver example that they were sending out to the device driver users. And by doing that, things have got a lot better. Uh, there's a um, talk that Byron did at our Functional Londoners group. So um, that's all good. A lot of talk there. Show me the money, right? Let's see uh, what we can do. So I'm going to show you um, a quick view over our trading screen. And I will show you some code after that. Uh, so this is a um, video that's uh, already public um, that shows uh, Tradeport's tra new trading screen called Jewel, which is written in a combination of F Sharp and C Sharp. The uh, domain modeling is written in F Sharp. The um, calculations engine, the concurrency uh, parts, pretty much all of the computation parts are in F Sharp. And a lot of the boilerplate, the plumbing we've done, in C Sharp, because it's something that, that we're familiar with. And the interop between the two is great. So um, to, as the screen goes uh, across, we seem to 
the colouring's not right, but um, some of these prices are firm prices on the market for um, probably gas. <laughs> and um, one of the things that our company provides is implied prices. So it looks over a market of 10,000 products and tries to imply over spreads, combinations. So if you've got January, February, March, it'll be able to say, we've got a price for you for quarter one. If you've got quarter one and January and February, we can imply March. And it's a huge graph of prices. And we, we update those prices uh, on the screen continuously. So F-Shop's not just about the server side. We've got functional in the client side. We've got functional server side as well. So going back to the slides very quickly. Uh, when we first um, started looking at F-Sharp, um, one of the issues we wanted to resolve was to add uh, new implied price types to our system, which was written in about 30,000 lines of C++. <coughs> and we, weren't, we didn't really have a huge amount of documentation. The code had been written in the late 90s, early noughties, um, before unit testing was particularly popular and documentation and stuff. Uh, everybody had left. So um, the way we approached it was actually to write in a kind of behavior-driven development style um, examples of what we expected the inputs and outputs of the system to be. Um, and then we were able to wire those up against the existing application so that when we made changes to our C++ app, we could be sure that it was behaving as it did before, and then we could add new features. And uh, that worked really well for us. And we did the testing side, because integration between C++ and f is great. We did all of the testing in f -sharp. And I'll, I'll show you that. We had such great success with that, it seemed like a shame not to go further. So let's uh, go for something a little simple. Uh, you can write uh, the samples. Um, over in an editor, we used actually a wiki page um, so that we could share that with our business users and our traders so we could work out what it was that the system was supposed to do and what the new system should do. Um, so here we've got a really uh, naughty example of adding two numbers. I guess I should have done Fibonacci as this is a mostly functional conference. Um, and what we can do is set breakpoints in text files <laughs> winning um, and so basically this code needs to map onto our actual application so I can step through and I'll reveal the magic in a second uh, basically to wire this up to your actual domain uh, we have uh, methods with regular expressions and um, it's very lightweight so each of these uh, wire ups is just a single line and then here I have entered into the calculator we're expecting an integer, and I can push that through. So uh, very easily, you can wire up your um, existing code to, um, to, to your actual objects. Um, now, once we've done this, I'll just keep let, I'll let that run through. Later on, we realized that we had other issues, performance issues, and we needed to extend the system a lot more. And so um, we've rewritten the C++ code into f -sharp. Um, We now do more functionality. Uh, it runs faster um, and offers a DSL as well. And the 30,000 lines of code are now 200 lines of f -sharp. Um, So that's nice. And uh, we can actually see the code. It's still quite complicated because it's quite a complicated problem. But um, uh, as graph traversal is. But it's... Um, it's much more manageable than it was before. So that's pretty happy. So let me, let me switch from here over to a little bit of a simpler solution. So one of the um, things that people don't suspect is that uh, with F-sharp, you've got, it's coming from OCaml, so object support's really good. For, so for domain modeling, so the next kind of task we did was to try and model the domain of our system. And we managed to get 
50 files boil down and be able to see our domain on a page. And uh, finally actually understood the domain of the system <laughs> in an easy to uh, read form. Um, can everybody see that okay? So here we have a very simple model of the order, an order in a record type. So uh, we have a namespace. Um, this is in effect uh, enumeration. Um, now the key thing here from an integration point of view, um, which we might not do if we were using um, a language uh, in its own ecosystem because we're running on .NET, I can actually access that from C Sharp. So if I pop in here into the C Sharp program, I've defined an order type. Um, so new order. And um, we've got IntelliSense over that. So it's actually created a constructor for us with all the labeling in. And all I've done is written three lines of code in the F sharp. So literally I can define a really rich domain in F sharp and consume it in F sharp. But if I need to, for plumbing reasons, uh, maybe I want to do WPF or win forms, it's all accessible from C sharp as well. Um, by default, it's all immutable, but we can set mutability if we want. We're not pure. We just like to get things done in the F sharp world. Um, start, start with um, good defaults, but you know, sometimes performance requires uh, different approaches. So uh, I can fill that in now, and all's good. Now, that's a very simple structure. How do we scale out to uh, larger things? Uh, so, how many people here work in finance? Is it everybody? Anybody not work in finance? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, I think uh, some of these things are applicable across domains. Um, I kind of find, um, coming from the games industry, there's quite a lot of us in finance, it's almost the same thing. Um, tracing performance and large amounts of data, um, but less fun funky graphics. So, um, one of the things that I'd um, add to an order is a time in force. So, I need to be able to say, I, I want to place this order in the market. I might say it's good until I cancel it. That's a fairly standard form. Uh, or I might say it's good for day. So at the end of the day, I want it out. I don't. Uh, the last thing you want to do is leave an order in the market, um, and then a month later you go, "Oops, um, my uh, I've been hit, and I don't have that anymore." So at the moment, it looks like an enum, right? And that that would be great. And we could do that in C Sharp or Java. But then we, then we realize, ah, actually, what I might want to do, or pretty much want to do, is say good till date. And here I can just hoist in a system date time. So uh, you've got much more advanced uh, capabilities with union types. So in effect, this has now built an abstract base class and a concrete class for each of these instances. And it's just trivial to do. And then we can pattern match over those. And now I can add that into my domain. Um, here we go. And that would be accessible from the C-sharp side as well, all the time. Um, one of the nice things here is because you can get yourself into a position in uh, C Sharp, Java, Scala very quickly with the tooling um, by you know pressing Alt Enter and generating the code. But it generally, you can't get out of that position. By the time you've got 50 files, it's very hard to, to track back. So by keeping a nice subtle, supple domain, you can as you as you're doing your first iterations and as you go. You can just look at it, understand it, and make subtle changes, add fields, and so forth. Um, we found that really useful. The only real thing that's um, survived uh, in our code that hasn't been churned hugely is the F sharp code that we've written. We've only had to make small amendments to it rather than having to create new factories, delete files, and completely move things around. So this works really well for us. So I'm going to finish off that little section. So that's uh, the domain uh, side of things. So th these are all kind of things that you could do in your um, 
uh, standard programming, uh, C-sharp Java language, but you're getting some leverage. Um, just a, a quote to kind of wrap this one up. Uh, this is from uh, Fortworks, uh, a um, consultancy business uh, which uh, Martin Fowler works for, and they have a technology radar every six months. I lifted these words uh, last year, um, but F sharp is excellent at concisely expressing business and domain logic, and I think this is pretty much a general thing for functional programming. But if you're on .NET, then F sharp's the great for that. Um, developers are trying to do business logic choose to express their domain in F sharp and their, pretty much their calculation stuff in F sharp, but they may decide to do their plumbing in C sharp. So you may keep that. Cool. Um, let's switch over to calculations now. So that's all a bit boring. Um, that's the, the kingdom of the uh, nouns. Let's move on to verbs uh, where we actually do some action. So come out back into the code. Uh, F sharp has uh, units and measure support built in. So in terms of uh, correctness, um, we can do our calculations. These are all compile time, so when you run, it actually boils them out. So you get all the benefits of the type checking of units and measure uh, without any runtime performance penalty. So uh, all we've done before is uh, just looked at uh, running applications. Anything that we have, we have an, a REPL in F sharp, like most uh, functional languages and we just press Alt-Enter, and we can um, execute our code. So now I can use that, euro two pounds, and I will push in 100 euros. And I think the conversion rate was rather good at this point. And now we've got coming out as pounds. Now. The nice thing here is if I were to actually get that wrong, it's expecting pounds. So that's, that's all pretty good. Um, what a lot of people are um, using F sharp for is they've got two gigabytes of um, Excel sheets and uh, they can't scale any further. They've got awful VB that they can't work with. And um, so a lot of the projects happening in investment banks is shifting over to um, F sharp from Excel. So that's kind of the, ca the calculation side of thing. And I'm gonna uh, keep going down that um, rabbit hole. So um, you can embed F sharp into Excel uh, as a VBA replacement. This is a, a product here called um, F cell. So if I, uh, define uh, some labels over these values. Um, I can now instantaneously get typed access to those labeled values on the sheet. So that's kind of nice for doing calculations. And you can see it's uh, inferred the type as well. Uh, so there's no compilation, just off you go. So it's a lot better place than having to deal with um, uh, VBA. And uh, I can define a function uh, which might even use some of those cells. And uh, then it will instantly appear here. And there's my black adder function. Um, so um, all of the power of F sharp is just available to you, not just in visual, your, your Visual Studio environment, um, but in many embedded environments too. Um, and then you can obviously work your way to the point where maybe you can throw away that spreadsheet or uh, take a lot of that spreadsheet into a safer place. So um, hope that'll give you an idea of the nice, smooth, simple, functional um, side there. So let's just flick through that. There's a little bit of a delay between these. So we've shown that. Um, this is... A nice uh, sign from the US. This is what happens, I think, when you don't consider units of measure. Um, <laughs> so, it's a genuine sign. I don't know if they were trying to be funny or not. Um, perhaps they were. Um, but, uh, but ironically, I mean, we've had um, 
the whole austerity uh, move um, seems to have been Excel errors. Um, and um, I was reading about the Australian uh, government losing three billion on an Excel spreadsheet, three billion dollars, and then finding it again. And in that case, they were really happy. Um, but uh, obviously, it can go the other way. Like, wow, we've got three billion dollars to spend. This is amazing. Um, so I've played around a little bit with um, Excel itself. Um, I tend to do a lot of hobby projects, and I was away. Uh, I had a holiday for a week, and I decided. I'd never written my own Excel, so let's do that. So I'll, I'll just quickly show you my version of Excel. Um, so this is written in F Sharp. There's about 900 lines of code. Um, it's not a huge prog program. You can import and export um, Excel files, um, simple 2003 Excel files. It supports all of the um, coloring and things that you have in Excel and the formulas. Um, so we can do. That's great, isn't it? You know, that was nice and easy. But I thought, well, you know, units measure are cool. So what if we could do Ah, that's looking better. So um, my Excel spreadsheet um, supports units of measure. And that was an extra 50 lines of code uh, vaulted into the parser. Um, so I'll show you that in a second. Um, so then we could um, we can support any arbitrary complex arbitrarily complex uh, unit type. So uh, we'll go with a keep going with a physics thing. Um, there we go, ten meters per second squared. Cool. Um, now I showed you the union types um, before. So um, the uh, types for uh, units of measure. You can have no unit, which we saw the first one, a unit of a string and a power, and composite units where you have multiple units. And that's pretty much it. And there's just a bit of pattern matching, and that was solved. Um, one of the things that I really like is pattern matching in functional programming languages. Um, so to implement uh, the functions, so I've implemented the majority of uh, Excel's functions. Um, we have a pattern match, a few helper functions here. We match over the name and values that I've passed as a parser uh, built in. For um, sum, we take the values, convert them to decimals, and call sum, one line, winning, and we just wrap it in a unit value. Uh, counts the same. Um, now, it starts to get more, more fun. If we've got if and a Boolean condition and a true and false value, if the condition is true, then return the true expression, otherwise the false expression, one line for an if. Um, and this. Here is an active pattern, another um, F-sharp specific feature which lets you add functions into your um, pattern match. Um, and it's really awesome for writing very simple parsers for simple languages like Excel. Um, and so on you go. Um, so you can write really quite powerful programs in just a few hundred lines. So just to give you an example of a medium-sized program. So, so far what I've shown you is what was in F sharp 1, right? Um, what I want to show you now is what's in F sharp 3. So, uh, I'll, double, I'll, I'll help let the slides guide me, guide me a little here. So, type providers. Anybody here played with type providers before? Okay, so, one, we got one. Um, Again, another unique feature to F Sharp. It's been in uh, F Sharp 3. It's part of Visual Studio. It came out in 2012. It's a very mature technology. What I'm about to show you is not a beta. It's something you can use, in, people are using in production. Um, the thinking behind type providers is when we're accessing data and we're accessing more and more data these days, we tend to take two approaches, kind of dynamic Python-like approach where everything's stringly typed. You run an expression, five hours later you realize you <laughs> typed the wrong string in because Python didn't run an error, it just carried on running. Um, and then the other extreme is you run some sort of code generation to generate the types. Um, 
that's kind of weird, isn't it? You've got metadata that you need to understand about metadata about your data, and we have to compile it into the programming language so that the programming language can understand the metadata originally. So we, we're combining from one metadata form to another. Type providers just say, well, that's just a waste of time. We'll let you inject your metadata and make it available as types, provided as types, directly in your code. So um, the first one I'm going to show is a very simple one just to show the general principle, which is an XML uh, type provider, but there's type providers for CSV, JSON, SQL, and we'll, we'll go into some more later. Um, the uh, message I'm going to process is a uh, fix uh, XML 4.4 um, uh, order message, so a, um, a trade, uh, a request to order. So uh, let's just drop back in there. So I have my order XML as a file. I open F sharp data. F sharp data is one of the um, many packages available on something called NuGet, which is .NET's package manager. So there's 15,000 packages available on NuGet. Um, and here's one of them, F sharp data, which has a bunch of type providers. So in order to set up the type provider, instead of using a, a D2D, we're just going to say, here's an example order, and I'm going to use the same order afterwards. And after I've defined that, it will be able to, it's in, it will infer the types and make those available to me. And now, um, all of that XML is at my fingertips. So no co-generation, just uh, instant typing over that. So that's pretty cool. Um, it just means instead of doing lots of boilerplate, setting things up, literally you just use a provider and you start pressing dot and exploring your data set. Now XML is a bit boring, you know, that's kind of solved, but it's, it's a, a nice, simple introduction. Also, um, you'll see um, that these are typed, so account ID has been inferred to be in and so forth. Uh, price will be, as we'd expect, decimal. Cool. So, not only can we um, collect data, we can connect to other programming languages. So, um, one approach, standard approach, is to try and rewrite everything in your own programming language and, and ignore all of the existing ecosystems. But that's just an unwinnable battle. The R community are great creating great statistical pack packages. Um, the MATLAB community have great packages, uh, Python community. So instead of saying we're going to rewrite all those to work in .NET, uh, we have the ability to just dot our way through their ecosystem, which just seems a, a little bit more sensible. So here I'm uh, referencing an R provider. So that's the statistical programming language R, not the pirate programming language. Um, so, anybody uh, not heard of R? Cool. It's uh, very much more in a statistical field. But once, um, once I've opened the R provider, I can actually walk through all of the uh, packages on R and call them. So, what I'll do for this sample is I'll pick that up and run that in an interactive window. We're going to go and pull um, financial data from Yahoo, uh, just from the web. And now I can actually ask R to do a calculation on MSN for T. Let's just take it down to uh, asking R to draw a draw. So not only can I swap data in and out of R, I can actually ask it to plot graphs for me. And I can do the same with MATLAB and Python. So this is a pretty awesome feature. So I'm going to take that a little bit further. Now where, where type providers kind of go beyond uh, what you can do with uh, code generation and, and strings is 
in the richer data sets. So, uh, for example, we've got, uh, the, say, the World Bank. It has a huge API. And if you try to co-generate it, you'd actually run out of RAM, right? You just, you wouldn't be able to compile it. So um, the type provider mechanism works lazily. It'll actually go and get the types as we wander through the API. So in the case of the World Bank here, I've opened uh, the World Bank provider, and I can type data dot, and we could pop in on uh, the United Kingdom, and we'll have a look at some indicators. And those are all the indicators for uh, the UK provided by the World Bank. So a huge amount of data on pretty much anything in the world at your fingertips inside Visual Studio. This is just one of the uh, data sources that you could connect to. Uh, you could connect to Freebase, which is a, a, collect, a huge uh, database of all things, open source database. Uh, a more recent uh, type provider is uh, for Xenomorph, and that lets you uh, connect to all of the um, stock indicators across all the exchanges and find out indicators on those, um, which is nice. And so if you imagine you can be in Excel, explore all the indicators across all financial markets and compute, that's pretty rapid in terms of um, doing your financial calculations. And realistically, um, this isn't something that you need to uh, be a developer for. You can, you can, as a developer, you can do it, but um, this enables people uh, who just want to get stuff done to get stuff done. So let's just have a look at this sample. This um, particular sample is compiling from F -sharp to JavaScript, so we can generate a web page. Um, the F -sharp codes gets compiled out um, so there's no .NET at the end. You just get a JS file that you can drop on your server. Um, we use a type provider so that we can attach to uh, different JavaScript libraries and get types from them. Um, so here we're going to connect to jQuery. And um, there's all the types of jQuery. And we can just explore uh, the jQuery API. So that's kind of nice. Or uh, we're going to want to plot with high charts. And there's the high charts API. Now, that, what this is doing is a little bit sneaky. Um, there's a Microsoft project called TypeScript, which is supposed to be a um, one of the, another one of these compiled to JavaScript languages, but it provides types. And so a bunch of people have gone and <coughs> annotated types over um, some of the more popular libraries, about 50 or 60 libraries. <coughs> so the F# -sharp community, one of the guys that Bray spent a weekend and wrote a parser for TypeScript's definition files so we can import them in. And so we have all of their types, which is nice. Um, so once we've got those things, I can set up a list of countries that I want to look at. And uh, we can do some messing around to get some input boxes. F -sharp has async built in. So we can just mark a block as async and uh, push it wherever we want to. And so this will actually compile out the async for us. So instead of having to do lots of nasty JavaScript continuations, uh, we'll just let, that, let the compiler deal with that nastiness. And we're going to uh, pull out from the provider uh, school enrollment tertiary, see what school enrollment is between different countries. So we've got about um, 80 lines of code here. And we're all typed. We just press dot through it. And when I run that, that's getting uh, compiled out to um, JavaScript now. Runs up a little web server. And uh, here we go. So now I can query World Bank and uh, back pops our high chart chart. So hey, what you can see here is, is that we're, we're really able to go across huge numbers of ecosystems and put together really interesting apps. So you've got all of the kind of standard um, functional uh, capabilities, but on top of that, this amazing type provider mechanism, the ability to um, 
access other languages. One of the other strengths is that you can access other, uh, you can compile to different platforms. So here I've compiled to JavaScript, you can compile to GPU, uh, you can compile uh, for Linux and Mac, you can use Xamarin Studio and Mono Develop and go to Mono, and so does you get the same support that you get in Windows. The f -shop compiler is open source on Apache 2, and so Xamarin uses the same compiler that Microsoft used to compile f -shop. You're not a second-class citizen. Um, so that's good. Let's, um, let's wrap up there. Did we, um, anybody a little bit surprised by type providers? Do you like, like type providers? Think it might be useful? They are pretty good. So, let's get back to it. So I'm going to kill that um, key button press I just did, which is the narrator up. Let's get back in there. So um, the R-type provider. Um, <laughs> I've shown you World Bank. So um, last couple of things. Um, if you're coming from a C++ background, you're using a managed language of any sort, um, you worry about pauses, latency. Um, .NET 4.5, big, big movement. Um, there are uh, new sets of garbage collectors specifically for financial trading applications. Uh, there's a low latency mode. Uh, for trading screens and sustained low latency for servers. Um, so things have really improved there and you can uh, hint at the garbage collector when it wants to collect. You can say, I don't want you to collect or I do want you to collect now and um, try and get that, that latency that you need. Um, on the Mono side, if you're running on Linux or Mac, uh, uh, Mono's uh, uh, garbage collector, it's old garbage collector, is uh, famous for not being great. It's a conservative garbage collector. This is, um, this is taken from a graph database. Um, uh, and they put different loads through their graph database. And the, the really noisy line is the old garbage collector. This is the new garbage collector, flat line, happy days. So um, even on uh, the Linux side, uh, with... Linux, Mono, F Sharp, pretty good co open source combination for running on the server. Hopefully you're sold now. Um, if you are coming from a uh, C Sharp Java background, um, any functional language will probably be a little bit spooky because um, it has different syntax. We have something called the F Sharp Cohen's, which are available online. It's a bunch of failing tests. Each time you get one of those tests to pass, you've learned a new part of the syntax. After about an hour and a half, you've got F sharp nailed. So um, that's nice and easy. Um, there's a tryfsharp.org. If you go there, you get um, a bunch of samples, including a finance section uh, where you can do charts. You get full IntelliSense in the browser, all the capabilities of Visual Studio in the browser, uh, and a wonderful resource for learning. Uh, all for free. Um, and it's got some really interesting things. There's a Hadoop Hive type provider. So you've got typed access over Hadoop. And um, yeah, that's, I definitely recommend checking that out. In terms of um, books, it doesn't, you just can't stop the F -sharp community producing books. Um, I'm working on uh, F -sharp deep dives with uh, Thomas Petrek and a number of other authors. And uh, the idea there was to uh, look at different domains. So instead of uh, looking at Hello World and other syntactical parts, we'd actually uh, write about domains like finance, machine learning, social gaming, and put a chapter each in the book. Um, so you can say, oh, I need to um, do machine learning for a bank fraud system. We have a chapter for that. So, um, but if you're just trying to get into the syntax, there's a lot of options. Um, the programming language concept books are uh, very nice. Um, they're using that in Denmark as, uh, for undergraduates doing computer science. And um, there's parts in there on how to write your own compiler, interpreter, garbage collector. So it's a really cute book. And they chose F sharp because um, they wanted to have less pages. Uh, so, no, um, it's a nice, concise language. So instead of having lots of boilerplate, it just gets down to the nitty gritty of. Um, solving the problem. It is possible to get t-shirts now with F-sharp once you've got your book. 
Um, and uh, pretty much the last slide. Uh, in terms of um, the job market, a couple of weeks ago I went to uh, IT Jobs Watch and I um, typed in uh, programming languages as a category and saw it by price, which is uh, obviously a good uh, strategy. And um, we need to discount some of these. So um, languages that have uh, less than two digits in terms of job adverts in the last three months probably aren't worth considering. And they may even be spelling mistakes. Um, <laughs> but in terms of London, the um, top three languages in terms of wages are Scala, F Sharp, and Clojure. So it does feel like in the financial centers, it's uh, a good safe bet to put your money there. Well, and also a good safe bet to get some money. And um, so hopefully you can see uh, things are going in the right direction. Questions? So everyone who uses it for real seems to be using it under Windows. Has that changed or not? Because uh, there are two problems with it. A, Windows is suboptimal in many ways um, uh, from a sort of DevOps and other perspectives. And also um, one thing that, that is pretty poorly developed is a sort of whole um, repeatable build infrastructure under Windows compared to, for example, Java or so. Uh, so um, has that changed in any way or...? Yeah, um, let me um, repeat out the question. While that's going on, I'm just going to put a website up. Um, so the question is, uh, F-sharp seems quite tied to the Windows ecosystem, uh, which is not a great thing if you're wanting to work with uh, Linux. And uh, Linux is pretty solid for doing server-side work. Um, we set up the F-sharp Software Foundation a year ago um, to provide support across uh, multiple flat platforms, nice, easy support. And uh, now you've got easy instructions to get going on Linux, Mac, FreeBSD. Um, there are um, bindings for Emacs, Sublime, Vim. Um, so in terms of support, it's come a long way. Probably off the Microsoft platform, the biggest thing for us over the last year has been much better support with Mono and Xamarin Studio. And now you can develop apps um, in F Sharp and target directly onto iOS and Android. And they'll compile out to native. And it's totally seamless. In terms of server-side Linux, um, the Xamarin tools work in, um, with Linux, work with Mac, and uh, you've got all of the kind of functionality uh, ASP.NET solutions, uh, different web solutions available um, on those platforms. But I think it's something that was growing out. Probably the biggest growth at the moment is on mobile for us, outside of the Windows ecosystem. So do you know anyone actually uses F-Sharp commercially and doesn't develop under the hood? Um, we have people doing small apps on uh, iOS and Android, but I don't, um, but I, I don't know everybody. So, yeah. It's something that we want to move into, but definitely uh, we've uh, benefited hugely from uh, all of the tooling that Microsoft's built, and uh, as a foundation, we're trying to aim towards uh, more cross-platform capability. We're not there yet. Is that? Yeah. Cool. Yep. Uh, you relate a related question. Uh, what's the user experience like on uh, Linux or Mac in terms of ID, in terms of uh, type providers? Uh, cool. Uh, like yep. So the question is, what's the experience on uh, Linux and Mac for type providers and F Sharp in general? Uh, with Xamarin Studio, you get pretty much uh, the same experience that you have with Visual Studio on Mac. Uh, on Linux, you've got MonoDevelop, which is quite close, not as um, as developed, but still all of the type provider stuff works. Um, so the guy who develops the um, F Sharp to JavaScript library um, actually just uses Linux. Um, and he's uh, released an app on the Android store, which he develops in Linux. And, uh, What's his experience with Linux? Is it not easy to use 
Uh, so at the moment, uh, you have Xamarin Studio on Mac and MonoDevelop on Linux. Um, MonoDevelop is still very good, but um, Xamarin have uh, been really successful in the mobile uh, area, and they've put a lot of effort into their tooling uh, on Mac and Windows. And they've recently uh, partnered up with Microsoft. So, cool. Any other questions? Okay. Right. Will, you, will you be around for the rest of the day? I'll, I'll be around questions? for another five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I think now it's lunch time. So I hope to see you back after lunch with Lance and the others. Thank you. Good.